This is Your Superior Self, episode 66, Why Being Sincere is So Important in Business with entrepreneur Ian Altman. There's some things I discovered about sales, but but even more importantly, about four doors down. Is So you think about it, you grow up, you know your neighbor on each side. You go another house down, you might know him a little bit less. You go another house down, maybe even less. And I get around five houses down to the McKibben's house. And I knock on the door. I say, hey, you want to buy some raffle tickets? And Mr. McKibben says no, and he slammed the door. And I go crying home. I was like 12 years old. I'm not selling these anymore. My mother, God bless her, says, well, so you have a choice. You could just give up or you can think about how would you approach his house or someone else's house differently in the future? Well, I'm not going to do that. And after a few days, it was like, all right, let me give this a shot. And each day I would kind of walk at a brisk pace past their house because I'd had this traumatic experience. And I'm walking by and I see this pizza box in their garbage. And it was round table pizza, which happened to be the coupon. So you would buy a raffle ticket for a dollar and you would get a $2 coupon. So it's like, man, you're making money from it. And so I like look at it, think about it, keep walking. And then next day I knock at the door and Mrs. McKibben answers the phone. And I said, hey, I see that you have round table pizza. Our family likes that too. And we have these coupons for $2 off. And each ticket that you buy enters you into a drawing and you get the $2 off. The tickets are only a dollar. So it's almost like, you know, getting $2 for $1. Um, if you're if you're still going to buy a round table pizza, maybe it's a good deal. And she says, well, how many are in a book? I said, 20. She says, okay, I'll buy a book. And so I'm like celebrating this. I'm walking away and the door opens and this is Mr. McKibben. He says, young man, I turn around. I'm like, oh no. He pulls, he walks over to me and he says, so my wife said she just bought a whole book of these things with these coupons. I said, yes, sir. I'm thinking he's going to nullify the whole deal. He says, why didn't you tell me there were coupons? (laughs) And it was this epiphany that I've taken with me throughout my life, which says, what is going on, Superior Nation? Welcome back to your favorite podcast, Your Superior Self, the podcast that gets you motivated to move forward in your life and get you motivated to wake up out of that zombie-like state and make you realize that you have this greatness inside of you. And I'm here to help pull that greatness out of you so that you can apply it to your life. Ah, I'm your host, Trey Downs. And on a side note, I am on day 14 of my 30-day challenge of running every day outside in the neighborhood. And my body is literally on fire Uh, in Delaware everything is flat so it's easy to run outside but here in Maryland it seems like there is a hill in both directions and my legs are on fire but you know what that pain is a trophy it's a trophy and it reminds me that I am pushing myself every day and that this is a challenge it's not going to be easy but when I hit that 30 day mark it's going to feel great because I did something straight for 30 days and now I can expand I can expand that energy and apply it to something else in my life even though this is a micro goal I want to apply that momentum that I have after 30 days to the macro and I am excited I'm also fired up about my conversation with today's guest, Ian Altman. He is a entrepreneur. He is an author. He is a great dude. He's genuine. I met him through my brother-in-law, Joe McClinsky, and we finally met in person at CadreCon down in Virginia. And we had a quick moment, but he is a great dude. He, he wrote the book, Same Side Selling. And well, he actually co-authored that with a guy named Jack Quarles. And the book is really interesting because it, it kind of combines the both aspects of buying and selling into one book. And it helps out entrepreneurs like myself kind of get both, both sides of the story. And I'm going to read an excerpt from the book. In chapter two, it talks about being unique. Start with what you do and whom you serve. Adopting a posture of solving instead of selling starts before you even talk with a prospect. It starts with your internal definition of what business you are in and who your customers are. 
To determine the unique shapes and designs of your puzzle pieces, you'll need to answer a few basic questions. Whom do you help? What do you do to help them? And why do they need your help? The answers may seem obvious, but for many organizations, it's a struggle to uniquely define your who, what, and why. Companies from startups to Fortune 500 organizations often revisit these seemingly simple questions and refine the answers, which then can be combined to form an elevator pitch. The stakes are high for your elevator pitch because, as we mentioned in Chapter 1, go back and read that, prospects are likely to classify you almost instantly as either one, someone who is trying to sell them something, or two, someone who may be able to help them solve a problem. Whether your pitch is already polished or still a bit rough, we can explain a different way to you to introduce yourself a way that is more effective and that sets the stage for finding impact together with with highly qualified prospects. I love the elevator pitch and that whole concept. So join the same side selling revolution and go pick up the book, Same Side Selling, today. And without further ado, here is my conversation with author, keynote speaker, and entrepreneur, Ian Altman. Ian, I want to say thank you so much for joining the show. Hey, Trey. Thanks for having me, man. So why don't you go ahead and give us like a, the rundown? What are you up to today? Well, as you said, I'm a keynote speaker. I speak at about 40 to 50 events per year. I've been fortunate to write a couple of books that have done pretty well, uh, Upside Down Selling, and the book I'm probably best known for, Same Side Selling, written, I don't know how many hundreds of articles in Forbes and Inc. and their online editions. And most of what I do is help companies on how they grow their businesses. And that's pretty much what I do today. And of course, I'm a father of two. As I like to say, I've got two children and uh, one dog and a wife I don't deserve. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did it all start for you? How did you get into uh, this line of work? Well, so I started I started my first company in 1993. I was actually, and this is something that might be of interest to your to your audience. I was working for a I was working for a company. It was like a mainframe company. This is back in you know the in the early 90s. And I was working for this mainframe company running what was called their client server division, which basically means PCs that are connected to each other. And um, and there was all the there was all these great business opportunities, but the company didn't want to pursue them. And the guy I was working for at the time, a guy named Bob Procelli, um, I I'm sitting there with Bob and I'm, I'm ripping my hair and I said, Bob, this is crazy. There's all this business that we could be pursuing, but the company doesn't want to pursue it. And they just want to ignore this stuff. And Bob says, well, what would you have to do in order to pursue these? He said, just, I just need permission. I can, I can sell it. I can actually do the work. I, I just, the company just wants to ignore this business. And there's probably half a million to a million dollars worth of business there that we're just going to let die on the vine. And Bob says, so if the company doesn't want to do it, why don't you do it? I said, no, because I, I, the company won't give me permission. He said, I'm not talking about here. What if you went out and started your own company to do this? Because if the company doesn't want to pursue it, it's not like you're stealing business from the company. The companies acknowledge they're not going to do this. These organizations have a need for it. Why don't you go do it? And the single best time probably to start a business could be when you have no house, no family, not even a dog, and you're in a position to take a little bit more risk than you might otherwise. And so I started my first company in 1993. We became a fast 50 company by 1998. Um, in, I think it was 1995 or six, I hired Bob Priscelli as my COO. So that was kind of a funny thing. And, um, and we, so then 98, we started a software company. We then grew both companies to the point that in 2005, a group of investment bankers out of New York acquired my company for cash and stock, and um, they asked me to serve as managing director of the parent company. And when they acquired my company, the combined value of the companies was about $100 million, and I grew the value of the businesses over the next three years to $2 billion. And what I realized is that I wasn't spending time with my wife. I wasn't spending time with my kids. And I thought, man, why am I still doing this? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm achieving all this financial success, but I'm almost non-existent with my family. 
So I went to the board and said, hey, I'm done. They said, what are you going to do? I said, I have no idea. And I took six months to do pretty much nothing except for drive my wife nuts. I served as president of a country club, which is something that sounds good. But if you want to take something you enjoy and learn to hate it, run it. And, um, and eventually people said, well, why don't you just help other companies and how they grow their businesses? And I'm like, well, what does that look like? Well, you can go speak. And I didn't even know there was a speaking industry. So I'm like, well, speak where? And that's kind of how it all started. And so in 2009, I first started speaking at events and, uh, you know, relatively small audiences. And now I routinely speak in front of thousands of people. But it was, you know, it all started from just somebody giving me a little nudge saying, what are you doing? Why don't you do something different? There's so much great information in there that I just want to dive into right now. So like, it's, it's kind of crazy. Like at the very beginning, you said, you know, the best time to do, you start your own business is when you don't have a house, wife or, or a dog. Was that, was that like that for you? Were you single? Did you live oh, in yeah. an apartment or I was, I was, sing, I was single renting an apartment? And of course I resigned and thought to myself, Oh man, what if I don't make what I'm making now? What if I accumulate a whole bunch of debt? What if this happens? What if that happens? All these things I was worried about. And of course, the first year I made five times what I had made working for this other company. And obviously the business grew very quickly. But here's the thing. We just, it's a simple concept, which is I just focused on what are my clients trying to achieve and how do I help them achieve it? And I wasn't really as focused on how much are we charging? What's our profit margin? It was just hey, do a great job for organizations and things will work out. And so we probably undercharged for a while, but we're still making decent money. And then once a reputation was established, you know, most of our business came from inbound inquiries where someone said, wow, you, you told us that we heard that this company got these results. We want the similar results. And, and I look back, man, we, we were involved in businesses that we had no business being in. I mean, one of the one of the first projects that I had was building electronic underwriting systems for one of the top insurance companies in the world. And then one of the other projects we did was handling all the new drug applications for one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies. And my belief is if they knew that I had a company with three people in it, there is no way they would have entrusted their entire pipeline of research to us. Well, how do you get that contract? Like, what do you tell them? Do you just blow smoke up their you know, rear end or how do you, I mean, you just, you just work it out. How does that work? Now, you know what? So uh, once again, every, everything I teach is integrity based and it's something I've always followed throughout my career. Meaning if I don't truly think I can help people, then I shouldn't be there. Because you should always point your client to who is the best resource to help them, even if it's not you, which is sometimes tough to do if you're trying to make your business work. But rest assured, the times that I regret more than anything else are when we would take on a client where we just weren't the best fit for them. They weren't the best fit for us. And we thought, yeah, we can make it work. And it'd be, you, know, you get sucked into the vortex of evil and just nothing good happens. So the interesting thing with this pharmaceutical um, a pharmaceutical client was they had all these new drug applications and the new drug application process at the time was they would do all this research, all these studies, they would compile all this, all these reports and they would submit to the food and drug administration, a document at the time in paper of about a million pages. Well, imagine how much work is involved in QC and, and checking and quality control on a million page document with cross references on almost every page. And so the funny part was that because the work I'd done in this mainframe company, I got to know these people. And so they reached out to me and said, hey, do you have any ideas on how we can speed up the process of the Food and Drug Administration? And keep in mind, we were competing against some of the biggest consulting and technology consulting companies in the world at the time. And so I came in and talked to them and they said, well, so what we're trying to do is speed up what, what will happen to the food and drug administration. And I just looked at them and said, so tell me about the process. And they said, well, so we do all this internally. And then it takes about 18 months to get this, get this, these submissions to the food and drug administration. I said, 
Okay. I said, and why is there such an urgency to get this stuff done sooner? They said, well, because we have these life-saving drugs and these types of drugs that we produce equate to a million dollars a day in profit to our company for every day we get it to market. So literally, if you save them 10 days, it's worth $10 million to them because once the drug becomes generic, all the profit goes out. So there's a, there's a finite set of time. And so I looked at them and I said, okay, so, so each day is precious. I said, well, here's my take. You, don't, you can't force the FDA to do anything. But how much is each day that you can save internally worth? They said, well, it's the same million dollars. I said, okay, are you guys open to focusing on how we can speed the internal process? And then if we show that to the FDA, the FDA may, may be inclined to do the same thing with their review process. And they're like, wow, no one else has thought of that. So everyone else was focused on how can we persuade and control the FDA? And I went in there and said, well, why don't we focus on the stuff we can actually control? And we built a team and you know did many millions of dollars with this one pharmaceutical company and then more and more and more of them, just focusing on how do we speed the process? So it was through, I guess, innovation and thinking differently than everyone else that got us the business and we won, one of the big consulting companies said, well, this is crazy. I mean, we, we looked these people up and did some research and their company is smaller than our entire team was going to be to work on your project. And the pharmaceutical company said, yeah, we know. Isn't that cool? <laughs> well, you talked about thinking different and, and you talked a little bit about your success and you know, it definitely shows with the numbers that you were throwing out, but you know, you, you couldn't have felt confident the entire time. Like there, there definitely were probably some down times where you thought, Hey, this might not work. Like talk about those. Like, was there any specific time where you were like, Oh my God, what did I do? I can't believe I just, I just resigned from my career and I'm doing this. Like, was there any, any point in time where you were like second guessing yourself? So that was that was the first time. It was when I resigned. It was like, what are you doing? Have you lost your mind? And then business was good for a while. And I was like, hey, this is great. The interesting thing is that we had so much success in that pharmaceutical space that all of a sudden we woke up one day and almost 90% of our revenue was from one customer. And I would sit there at night and say, what if these people all of a sudden – decide they want to go somewhere else? What if they just don't like the shirt I wore one day? And we had a choice. It was either, okay, scale back what you're doing for them so they don't dominate you or grow the rest of the company to compensate for it. And here is the more interesting part was that I was doing, so keep in mind, I started the company and I was doing a lot of the consulting work on site at these clients. And now it's like, okay, we want to grow the business, but I can't grow the business if I'm sitting out on site every day. So we need to extract me out of the system. So I hired some people, trained them, and said, okay, we're going to bring them out to this pharmaceutical client, and we're going to transition them in. So I bring them out there, and the people running the program are, are still dear friends of mine. But at the time, we thought of them as like tough Philly guys. These guys were based in Philadelphia. And so I said, hey, we're going to bring these guys in, and we've trained them, and I think you're going to love them. And, of course, at the time, they were really set on me being there and didn't want anyone else there. And so I introduced these two guys. I said, hey, you know, this is Tom. This is Rob. They're going to be working on this stuff. These guys are great. And, and this, guy, this guy, John, at the client looks at him and says, yeah, um, hey, welcome, and just so you know. If you guys aren't every bit as good as Ian just said, you're on the first bus out of here. And I said, well, thanks for the ins inspiration for these guys. <laughs> and of course, over time, you know, within three months, they would say, well, Ian, why are you coming up here? We don't want to pay for you to be here. These guys are awesome. And that was it. I mean, it worked out great. But there were times where I thought, man, we're going to lose this account and then we're dead in the water. There were times where I thought, man, you know. I'm never going to get out of this account. I'm going to be stuck here forever. I'm never going to be able to grow the business or do anything else. And, you know, there were little political games here and there, and there were people internally trying to hire our people and, you know, a lot of challenging things. But over time, it worked out okay. Mm, that's a lot of control. They basically had control, like 90% of your revenue. 
they did. So it's you know they always there was a, what's that what's that line? Never let them see a sweat. So when when time would come for us to renew our contract each year, I had to sit there with a poker face and say, hey, look, you know, um, you know the the guys are you know we love doing this work with you. Um, I just need to know if we're renewing for next year. Here's the increase. And and by the way, if this doesn't work for you guys, I totally understand, and we can assign them to other projects. No, no, they're doing great. Now, keep in mind, one of the keys was we kept track of how many days we saved them in time to market. So anytime there was any sort of negotiating position, I would say, man, you know, so so I was looking at looking at the way we track this. It looks like we saved what is it, 117 days in time to market last year? Is that what you guys have? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And and you guys said what? It's about a million dollars a day? Yeah. Okay. And and what did you pay us? Well, a couple million dollars. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's just just making it making sure that everybody understood that we were delivering value that was orders of magnitude beyond what they were paying. Wow. So what do you like suggest like smaller companies or, or uh, smaller um, startups? Like wh- what percentage should they should, should their clients be contributing to the revenue? What, what, like 15 percent at least? Well, here's here's the challenge. When you start out, you're just trying to find somebody who believes enough in you that they'll pay you for something. And so the first client you get is likely contributing 100 percent to your business to your revenue because you don't have a second one. And so the idea is more what I, what I advise people is think of it in kind of buckets or compartments. So you say, okay, I'm going to start, let's say a consulting business and I'm going to serve these three types of clients. So what types of clients within each of those buckets do you need to have so that you're credible in that space? So for example, we said we're going to do pharmaceuticals. So we had clients like, um, GlaxoSmithKline, it was SmithKline Beecham at the time. We had, you know, just, uh, you know, um, Procter and Gamma. We had a lot of those blue chip type clients that everybody would know. And then in the insurance sector, we started with, I, I said, okay, we want to help people in insurance. Someone from Chubb Insurance approached us, who's a very reputable company. And we said, so who else do we need in this space? And we diversified and we ended up with a lot of the big names and some of the regulatory organizations in that space. And then it was, well, okay, so now we're going to do manufacturing and, and food products because we dealt with a lot of regulated industries. And it was, okay, let's see if we can get Kraft Foods and Coca-Cola and Daimler Chrysler. And we were just very intentional about the types of clients we went after. And keep in mind, all we were doing was trading off of what we had done for someone else to get the next client. So we'd walk into Chubb and say, well, we may not be able to help you, but here's what we we're able to do for Smith Klein. And then after we got Chubb and Smith Klein, we'd talk to somebody at another insurance company and say, well, we may not be able to help you, but here's what we have been able to do for Smith Klein and for Chubb. <laughs> and then it was, well, gee, we haven't worked with a food company like you guys at Kraft, but here's what we've done for Chubb and Smith Klein. And, you know, so, and it's just each one just kind of built from the next, from the prior one. And it's just getting those first people to believe that you are focused on their success more than your own. And you can't fake that. You either really care about moving the needle for them or you don't. So if you're just doing it for the money, don't do it. If you're doing it because you want to make a difference, that'll come through. And someone's going to say, you know what? I can believe in these people. Let's give them a shot. And then don't mess it up. Do you think they can tell, though? Like, can they tell whether or not you're about the money? Absolutely. I mean, think about it. You can. I mean, if a plumber comes to your house and is like, well, here's what I charge for this. Here's what I charge for that. You know, they're just focused on the money. If the plumber comes in and says, so what's been going on? How's that impacting your family? How's it impacting the house? Let me get to the bottom of it and see if I can solve this thing in as economical a way as possible. Then all of a sudden you think, man, this person is focused on us. And so what do you do? You tell 15 of your friends, hey, if you ever need a plumber, you should call this person. And then they establish a reputation that says this is somebody you can trust. There's, you know, there's an HVAC guy we've used at our house. And we refer him to people and they go, oh, you know what? He's, he's more expensive than other people. I said, that's right. And if he comes to your house and says, hey, you don't need this, it's because you don't need it. And if he comes to your house and says you need it, you can trust the fact that you need it because the guy's as honest as the day is long. 
and hey, he did work for us and something went wrong. And a year later, he fixed it and said, no, no, it's all covered under warranty because that shouldn't have happened. It was a flaw from the manufacturer and um, you couldn't have known. So I'm going to I'm going to eat that. Guess what? It's the only guy I recommend for heating and air conditioning because he did the right thing, was focused on the result, not focused on just billing for his time. You're absolutely right. I, I feel if I could do it over again, like I would definitely go into a trade. Like I would for sure, because they can own the market. If you think about it, like if you're a plumber or an electrician or HVAC guy and you show up on time, you dress well and you take care of your customers and you pr your price is reasonable, like you can own the market. Like, because like, why do you think there's Angie's list? Because no one knows, no one trusts anybody. They pay extra money a month to read reviews and, and get reviews from a website uh, if you had just a decent, decent money, decent funds for marketing and, and you do, obviously you're going to get word of mouth, but you could own the market if you just show up and do a, a great job. Absolutely. But guess what? The same thing applies to B2B. So the thing is, you know, I've got, I've got clients of mine who are, let's say in the IT services field and most people in IT services, their whole model is, Hey, we're going to support you and here's what you're going to pay per month. Now, if we encounter a problem, you know what we do? We charge you to fix the problem. Well, what, well, aren't you guys supposed to be the people preventing the problems? Oh, yeah, but if we didn't do that, then you pay extra for us to fix the problem. I mean, it's almost counterintuitive. But I have clients who their whole focus is, hey, we're going to charge you a fixed fee. Here are the three things that can, that can change the conditions. And if those three things happen – then there's additional fee. Outside of those three things, you pay a fixed fee every month. By the way, our monthly fee is 30% higher than other people who are going to nickel and dime you. But you're going to know this is your fee unless one of these three things happens. And guess what? The three things are if you get a excuse me, if you get attacked by some, you know, some malware or something like that, that that, you know, somebody somebody clicks on a phishing email or something like that. If you add facilities, if you add personnel, then guess what? You've just increased the complexity of what we're doing. Outside of that, here's a fixed fee. And guess what? They get a ton of business because the client says, yeah, if they mess something up, we don't pay for it. They do, which means what just has happened is the vendor has the same interest as the client, which is making sure that everything runs smoothly and there are no problems. As opposed to most IT vendors, if all of a sudden something gets messed up, they make more money. They're actually incentivized for things to go haywire. It's crazy. And you have a, a beautiful family. Um, you're very successful in your career. How do you balance the two? How do you show up as the best dad and the best husband? You know what? Sometimes, sometimes I feel like I'm not. You know, there's there's times where you know, as your kids grow up and, and they make good choices, you feel like you had some influence. I think, you know, I'm fortunate in that my wife and I have been married 21 years and she takes on the lion's share of that role. And during those years when our kids were young, I was flying 175,000 miles a year. I was rarely home. And the irony is that my wife would say, yeah, if Ian's going to be on the road for three weeks to Asia, rest assured Within an hour of him leaving for the airport, one of the kids has got some rare illness and the dog's going to throw up on the rug. <laughs> you can guarantee it's going to happen. <laughs> and the smoke detector is going to be going off. Like, you know, just all these things will happen at once while I'm, while I'm gone. And so, you know, I try to focus on experiences with the family, which is like, hey, look, you know, what are the experiences that we can create that will – that will create memory. So, you know, it doesn't have to be the most luxurious thing. It's just, we plan when we do vacations or trips, it's what's going to create an experience. And are you teaching your kids good values? And when you are home, are you carving out time for your spouse? So, you know, is, you know, things like that, that just candidly, you know, you got to be very intentional about it if you're not here. And, you know, people say, Oh, you're great at this and that. You know, we all have imposter syndrome. There's times where I think to myself, man, was I there enough for my kids? Am I there enough for my wife? And I think it's, you know, any of us who thinks that we're balancing all that, 
you know, whatever you're focusing on, something else is suffering. And it's just, there's times where you try to shift that balance. And fortunately in what I do now, it gives me the flexibility to, there are times where I'm on the road and nothing can change. And there are times where, uh, you know, my, my son was looking at the Ohio state university and I said, all right, dude, we're going to take a road trip. We're going to go check out Ohio state. And, you know, just took a few days in the middle of the week to go do that. Well, if I had a regular job, I couldn't do that. So it's, and, but guess what? I may also be given a keynote address in Vancouver on a Saturday. So you just got to pick your slots in terms of when can you be there knowing that you can't always be there at the other times. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Wherever you're at, you have to be there. If you're at work, you have to be hundred percent at work. If you're at home, you have to be hundred percent at home. Um, you know, looking back at your, at your childhood and how you grew up and how you obtained the success and, you know, the atmosphere that your, your son has grown up in, like how different is that? Like, what, is it very similar or did you have a different kind of childhood? You know what? I was fortunate to have a very supportive childhood growing up. I'm the youngest of four and my closest sibling is seven years older than me. So it was almost like I had multiple parents and, you know, just a very supportive environment, but also one that I didn't get babied. Um, so even though I was the babiest of the family, I, I remember vividly selling raffle tickets for, for our baseball league. And, you know, whoever sold the most raffle tickets won a bike. And I'm like, I'm dedicated to doing this. And, you know, went to the neighbor on each side and showed up with raffle tickets. Hey, you want to buy some raffle tickets? Sure, I'll buy 10. They were, you know, a dollar a piece. It's like, wow, this is awesome. I'm going to win this bike. And I remember my dad ran production in the garment industry, in the clothing industry um, for these different manufacturers. And I said, well, dad, hey, can I come to your office and sell this stuff? And he said, you can. However, you can't tell anyone that you're my son because – then people are going to feel obligated to buy it. And you've never been to the office and so no one knows who you are, but you know, just you can come in, but you can't tell anyone that I'm your son. So you can give your first name, not your last name and just get a Yeah. But this other kid, his dad does this and that. My dad said, yeah, I, I understand, but, but I'm not willing to do that. And so two important lessons. The first one was that as I was going through his office in the plant, there's some things I discovered about sales, but, but even more importantly about four doors down is, so you think about it, you grow up, you know, your neighbor on each side, you go another house down, you might know him a little bit less, you go another house down, maybe even less. And I get around five houses down to the McKibben's house and I <laughs> knock on the door and say, Hey, you want to buy some raffle tickets? And Mr. McKibben says, no. And he slammed the door and I go crying home. I was like 12 years old. I'm not selling these anymore. My mother, God bless her, says, well, so you have a choice. You could just give up or you can think about how would you approach his house or someone else's house differently in the future? Well, I'm not going to do that. And after a few days, it was like, all right, let me give this a shot. And each day I would kind of walk at a brisk pace past their house because I'd had this traumatic experience. And I'm walking by and I see this pizza box in their garbage. And it was round table pizza, which happened to be the coupon. So you would buy a raffle ticket for a dollar and you would get a $2 coupon. So it's like, man, you're making money from it. And so I like look at it, think about it, keep walking. And then next day I knock at the door and Mrs. McKibben answers the phone. And I said, hey, I see that you have round table pizza. Our family likes that too. And we have these coupons for $2 off. And – each ticket that you buy enters you into a drawing and you get the $2 off. The tickets are only a dollar. So it's almost like, you know, getting $2 for $1. Um, if you're if you're still going to buy round table pizza, maybe it's a good deal. And she says, well, how many are in a book? I said 20. She says, okay, I'll buy a book. And so I'm like celebrating this. I'm walking away and the door opens and this is Mr. McKibben. He says, young man, I turn around. I'm like, oh no. He pulls, he walks over to me and he says, so my wife said she just bought a whole book of these things with these coupons. I said, yes, sir. I'm thinking he's going to nullify the whole deal. He says, why didn't you tell me there were coupons? <laughs> and it was this epiphany that I've taken with me throughout my life, which says I was selling the coup. I was selling the raffle ticket 
and you in essence you want to donate for for a raffle ticket instead of you're going to get two dollars for one dollar how many times do you want that to happen and so it's funny i took that same approach at my dad's office trying to sell these raffle tickets or in essence coupons to people and i'm about halfway through the plant and one of the production managers says hold on one second i know somebody and he walks into my dad's office and, and looks at him and says I, mean, I, I know your family does pizza and this is a deal. You know, you gotta, you gotta hear what this kid has to say because you should buy these. And my dad just starts smiling and on his head. He goes, yeah, I know all about it. He goes, no, no, you gotta meet this kid. He goes, I've known him his whole life. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. What are yeah, some, but it's, what are some other sales lessons that you learn? Um, you know what? I mean, the biggest thing, not so much even, even growing up, but it's, you know, in, in that, in the, you know, I grew up in a household where there was a lot of humor and um, and just a lot of smiling, which is very fortunate. So, uh, you know, I'm just a big fan of it should never be confrontational. I think most people have a very negative opinion or connotation of sales because they've never been taught how to approach sales with integrity. Mm, I love that. And right? like and selling if, equals trust. Right. I think you said that. Yeah, I mean, exactly. So selling is all about trust. And let's face it, none of us likes to feel like we're being sold to. So if you walk into a store and the hyper ambitious salesperson walks up to you and says, may I help you? You're likely to say, no, thanks. Just looking. So why is that? Is it because you think you know the store better than them? No, it's because most people in sales are pushing what's in their interest, not in what's not what's in their client's best interest. So I refer to that as axis displacement disorder. It's where the seller believes the axis of the earth has shifted and the world now revolves around them. And so instead, we have to think of it as what's in it for my client? Why is this advantageous to them? What are they trying to overcome? So if I ask people how many people would like to be sold to, no one would raise their hand. And if I said how many people have an important issue that – either keeps them up at night or gives them some concern. Almost everyone raised their hand. They have something like that. Okay. And how many people would be open to talking to somebody who might be able to make that problem go away? And just about everyone would raise their hand. And so if you approach the idea of selling as solving and trying to figure out, okay, what could be going on in someone's world that I can make better through whatever it is that I sell or offer – now you're you're working from the same side collaboratively with them to solve a puzzle rather than trying to drag someone across the finish line to make a sale. Mm. I love that whole concept. Did you did you write about that in your book? Yeah, so in same side selling, we talk about that quite a bit. I, I co-wrote same side selling with a guy named Jack Quarles. And Jack is a guy you can probably tell from his last name Quarles. Jack spent two decades in purchasing and procurement. And um, and so we talk about these adversarial traps that pit buyer and seller against one another. In fact, we have the second edition of Same Side Selling that um, that launches May 1st, 2019. And, you know, we've got all these case studies and stories of companies that fortunately have seen some pretty remarkable results. And it's all where people can feel good about it and look and look themselves in the mirror and say, wow, I'm serving my clients really well and my business is growing at the same time i'm assuming that uh i can get an autographed copy of that of course man <laughs> of course happy I to love it so i want to go back to uh when when you you know you, you made some money on your first uh on your first company um you know you talked about the the part where you went and managed a country club and you were looking for fil for uh, fulfillment and i kind of relate that to Tony Shea's story, uh, the CEO of Zappos, when he yep. when he first sold his first company, I think it was Link Link Exchange, or I can't remember the name Something of it. Something like that, yeah. Uh, where he sold his company, and obviously he, he made a ton, he made a killing on that. Um, and then after that, it, it was kind of like he just didn't know what to do with his time, and he was looking for fulfillment. I mean, could you relate to that a little bit? I mean, you know, I don't, I don't even know if it was so much fulfillment because there's not very much fulfilling about a country club. It's kind of an elitist environment. Um, it was more that I was on the board trying to make that community better. It was a place where my kids spent time at the pool and playing tennis and things like that. And it was just, Hey, look, we benefit from all this stuff. 
let me get on the board and try and help. Next thing you know, the the general manager was gone. We were looking to hire somebody else. You know, I I happened to be took the took the term as president of the country club. Next thing you know, I'm filling in as the interim general manager, not getting paid for it, just okay, I'll sit in. And I think it probably resulted in my wife feeling a whole lot better about things because if you think about it, I had gone from traveling 175,000 miles a year to being home constantly with nothing to do. And I'm going to her saying, hey, how can I help with this or that? And she's thinking, just look, I got a routine. Get out of my way. <laughs> like, I, I don't need you to to review how I'm doing the laundry, dude. <laughs> like, just I got this. You go do something else productive. And it was more – you know, I, I think that no matter how much financial success I could possibly achieve, I'm one of those people who will probably never retire because I love fixing things and figuring out what what isn't working. You know, I, I work for I, I, I speak for a lot of companies that are these blue chip companies that everyone would know. But some of the most gratifying work I do is with small to medium sized businesses, because if I take a multi-billion dollar company and show them how in one year to add $50 million in business. The sad part is nobody cares. But if I take somebody who's doing $2 million and take them to eight, I just change their life. Mm. And so that's probably the most fulfilling part of it is the people who say, man, I can't do this. I'm awful at it. I hate being in selling situations to two years later, life is good. They're buying vacation homes. They have no worries in the world. And they say, oh, I love talking to clients about projects. That, that's interesting. Can, can anyone be a, like a salesman? Can anyone sell something? Um, and the answer is yes, and it depends. Um, and what I mean by that is most of it comes down to mindset. And so there, there are certain limiting beliefs that people can have. So if you have a limiting belief that says, um, gee, I don't believe in what I'm selling. I don't care how good you are. You're not going to be good at selling that because if you don't believe in it, the truth's going to come through when you talk to your clients or prospects. So if you truly believe in something, then you can learn how to ask the right questions, have the right conversations to be successful growing a business. And I've done this with people who are um, in blue collar trades who are selling B2B, B2G, you know, it doesn't matter. It's just, it's all about shifting the focus to them because more than anything else, when someone's buying a service from somebody, what they really want to know is, does this person understand my situation better than anybody else? And if so, they're inclined to work with you. And if not, not so much. So the only way you can really come across as somebody who understands someone else's situation is by asking great questions about their situation. And so if you're pitching your features and benefits, you're not accomplishing that. But if you're talking about, gee, so how long has this been going on? What have you done to try and solve this? Now they realize that you're genuinely interested in what they're trying to solve, not just how do I get to a sale? I think that's a I think that's a common mistake, right? I think everyone starting out is all is always worried about making the money and converting. I don't think they're thinking about the the the, the long game of it, right? Is setting up a career in this. And you're absolutely right. Like you got to take interest in their needs and try to solve that. Um, you you have a ton of knowledge in, in sales. Like, did you ever have like a mentor to help you with this gain this experience? You know what? I I learned I learned a lot by messing things up. And so, you know, I, I, I didn't really have a mentor per, per se, but I learned a lot of what not to do. So I'd see people do things that scratch my head and say, that doesn't make, that doesn't make a lot of sense. That can't be the right way to go about it. You know, people would, I, I would, I would sit in a meeting and let's say you had software that did three things and people would say, well, we need this fourth thing. And someone else in the room would go, oh yeah, it can do that. And I'm thinking, no, it can't. So what's wrong with that answer? Well, what's wrong with that answer is eventually if the client buys it, they're going to realize it doesn't do that. Now what do you do? So now you just misrepresented something. It's going to become the bane of your existence, and you're going to have to explain to them why it doesn't do what someone told them it does do. 
And how much time are you going to spend on that? Your reputation goes in the toilet. So what you have, as I always have to think about is how do I get repeat and referral business? So if you want to grow a company, the first thing you have to do is not lose your existing customers. <laughs> because if you want to grow your business, but the only way you can grow it is by replacing the people you lost – then guess what? If you lose 30% of your business, then in essence, the first three months of your year are just spent replacing the customers who you lost. Mm. And the most expensive part about that is the new clients cost more than the, the, uh, of course, and the clients you already have. I mean, of course, but so what's the best way to get new clients? Well, it's from referrals and warm introductions and testimonials. Well, how do you get that? Well, you get that by delivering results. So one of the things we write about, write about in Same Side Selling is the trap of selling resources instead of results. So nobody is sitting around thinking to themselves, well, what I really want is five hours of a software engineer or five hours of an attorney or five hours of a computer programmer. No, what they're saying is I have this issue that I'm trying to resolve and I want someone to solve it. So if you focus on the results, you're much better off. So what if instead you walked into somebody and said, so what happens if you don't solve this? And they say, oh, man, if we don't solve it, all these terrible things happen. Okay, well, I mean, you couldn't quantify what that costs you, could you? Oh, yeah, it probably costs us X dollars every month that we have this problem. Okay. So what does success look like? If we, Let's say we did all this work. How would you know it's successful 90 days from now? And they describe what that looks like. Well, now here's the beauty. If you've now documented and you know what success looks like and you know what their prior situation was, then in 90 days, I get to go back to them and say, hey, you know, when we started this project, you said you had all these major problems. Here's what it was costing you. And that 90 days out, you would know if it was successful, if these five things had happened. Zero to 10, how did we do in reaching those five things? The client says, oh, it was amazing. You're 10 on all those. You hit them all. That's awesome. Hey, can you think of one or two other people who might be experiencing those same problems who would like to achieve that same result? And now you've got amazing referrals because that person's not doing you a favor. They're now doing the other people a favor saying, hey, my understanding is you have the same problem we were having. And this guy, Trey, fixed those. Would you like me to make an introduction? Because he may be able to fix it for you, too. Way more powerful than saying, hey, listen, uh, Trey's going to call you up and he's going to – I gave him your home number and your personal email address. He's going to harass you to change either your email or your phone number. <laughs> or, or move. Because that's the way most referrals happen. So you talked a little bit about failure. Like what, what is one failure that has really changed you know, changed how you look at success? Or, 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 or how about this? One failure that has helped you obtain success. Um, I don't know if it's helped me attain success as much as I'll give you one of the, one of the biggest failures is so after when, when I was selling my company to this other group of people right towards the end of the transaction, there were some things that I just, you know, you kind of have your little spider sense. I'm like, you know, something seems kind of weird in this deal, but you know, I'm probably just nervous about stuff and you know, we'll move on. So we did the transaction, grew the company to amazing value left the business. I was gone from the company for a few years and the chairman of the company gets indicted on like 60 counts of fraud. And the guy was embezzling money out of the company. And of course I still owned a bunch of stock in the company, but didn't have any other role in the business. And there's, there's two important lessons that I learned. One was thankfully I never treated the stock in that company as liquid. And I used to always tell my wife, look, until that company goes public and until someone physically buys those shares, we just need to pretend like they don't exist. Because on paper, we've got a gazillion dollars, but it doesn't mean anything until we can sell it. So let's pretend it isn't even there. And there were people I worked with who didn't take that same approach and were leveraged the hilt. And when this guy got indicted on fraud, you know, the thing just collapsed like a lead balloon. And a lot of people were left holding the bag. Um, and the other big lesson is just, you know, trust your instincts. Because, I mean, I learned a ton. I did business all around the world. Um, learned to deal with all sorts of different cultures and cultural norms. I remember we were, in, we were in Istanbul, Turkey. 
we had signed this deal. We go to meet with the the principals, of the organization we're doing this licensing deal with. And the guy says, well, let's talk about the terms. I said, well, we've already signed everything. And the guy says, yeah, we're not doing any of that stuff. And that was just, we learned later from some people culturally, that's the way they do business. It's just, okay, we agree to the deal. Then we negotiate the, the terms. And I'm thinking, but you already signed the deal. Yeah, but it's not really enforceable. So here's what we're actually going to do. And I thought, that, you got to be kidding me. So you start realizing, okay, there are different cultural differences. I remember we did work in in a country. I don't want to say what country it is because it doesn't matter. But we're dealing with these people, and the guy says, oh, yes, well, you know, this all looks good, but the price is too high. And I said, okay, well, all right, that's I understand. So how much do I? Oh, it's twice what we would pay for it. I said, okay. And we're going back and forth, and he's really digging in his heels. And finally I looked at him. I said, okay, just – just so we're clear, we haven't given you a price yet, right? And we hadn't, but it was just culturally their approach was, okay, just start negotiating on price and say that the price is too high, even though we had not given them a price. And so there are a lot of different lessons that I learned over time that just became really funny stories that um, you just kind of learn from and tuck those away. And when a situation comes up, you go, ah, that's where I can use that. How can people connect with you, Ian? Um, the best way is ianaltman.com. So it's I-A-N-A-L-T-M-A-N.com. It's um, Ian Altman on Twitter. Connect to me on LinkedIn. You know, my approach is, you know, anybody wants to reach out, if you reach out on link, LinkedIn, just mention you. Say, hey, I heard you on Trey's show. Love to connect, and I'll definitely accept those connections. It's uh, And just here's a tip for people. If you're using LinkedIn, don't send the blank connect. So little button that says connect, you want to click on the person's profile and say personalize invitation so you can, you can send a message to people. Because if you get those generic ones, you start wondering where they come from. Is that, does that come with the, the uh, pro or whatever it is? Nope. Uh, and any, the, the free version. So if you click on the little ellipse, which is the dot, dot, dot next to somebody's profile, it'll say personalized invite. Mm. I never, I never even knew that. That's, that's and great. So you, yeah, so you can do that. And same, same thing on the, um, on the, uh, the app. So works the same way on the smartphone, even if you have the free version. I mean, I have, I have a paid version, but it works the same on the free version. So you can personalize the invitation. And I think on the, I forget if it's either on the app or, or um, in the browser, you can click connect and it says, hey, do you want to add a note? So in one case, it prompts you. The other one, you actually click personalized invite once you click on someone's profile. Yeah, because I hate the ones that are like automatic. Like, you know, the guy has his assistant send you an invitation to connect and it's like this generic little note. It's like, hey, thanks for, you know, it's just like fill in the blank, fill in your name, connect. And I'm like, oh, that's I, at least I, tri- yeah, sound I don't, like a personalized note or something, man. Yeah, Come on. I, I, I only get about a dozen of those a day. And it's um, and so invariably what I do is I say, hey, thanks for reaching out. What inspired the connection? And I know if I don't get a response within a day that it was just some automated spam. And then, and then, and then I block them and I move on. But if someone says, hey, you know, I, I, I heard you on Trey's podcast or, hey, I read this in Same Side Selling. I'd love to connect. Did I live for that? I mean, it's people will say to me, they'll send a note and then I'll respond and they'll, they'll say, oh, well, I'm sure this is just an automated response or, you know, or Ian's assistant. And I'll respond, why would you think that? It's like, oh, really? It's like, yeah, I mean, I live for this stuff. It's, you know, someone will say, well, hey, how should I approach this or that? I mean, that's, that's what this is all about. So that's, that's, that's the, that's the most fun part is taking somebody who's trying to figure it out and give them some insight that hopefully can help them. And candidly, there's times where someone will say, Hey, I tried this. Didn't work. All right. Well, let's, let's look at how that happened and why it happened. So to finish it out strong, cause this has been a legit interview, uh, or talk, let's say you're, let's just hypothetically say you're on it. You're on an elevator and you have like 10 seconds and you, and somebody wants to know how to be the best salesman they can possibly be. What would your advice be to them? My advice to them would be no, unequivocally the problems that you solve for your customers more so than the products or services that you offer. If you think like a physician, what you want to think about is what are the symptoms or conditions that you treat, not what are the drugs or procedures that you prescribe. And if you can do that, then you can instantly connect with people about their issues, not what, not with the things that you're selling.
I love it. His name is Ian Altman. Check him out. Buy his book. Thank you so much, Ian, for coming on the show. Thank you, Trey. I want to say thank you to Ian for hanging out with us today and, and giving us a ton of value. You can check him out at ianaltman.com. You can also check me out at yoursuperiorself.com. Make sure to register on the email list so that way I can send you these episodes right in your inbox. And as soon as you wake up in the morning to answer some of those unwanted emails, you can click on the link and be able to download this episode and start your day off right. So check me out on Facebook at Trey Downs, D-O-W-N-E-S, and Instagram at tdowns80. I'm over on Twitter at Downs Trey, and come check me out on all social media platforms. Hang out, uh, see some of the behind the scenes action that I got going on over there. All right, guys, have a great week, and I will talk to you later.